Uh, this is a lecture for my fifth hour class on the 28th of uh, April. Anyway, uh, well, we're talking about the election of 1920, uh, Roosevelt or Cox and Roosevelt versus Harding and Coolidge. And then there's one guy thrown in, uh, Eugene V. Debs, who ran uh, as convict 9653. Uh, the Democrats didn't have a chance in this election. Harding and Coolidge are going to be elected by a landslide, and Harding and Coolidge are the beginning of the Republican ascendancy. In other words, three conservative Republicans, and that's not exactly true. The last one, Hoover, is sort of progressive. But uh, anyway, three Republicans in the 1920s. And the thing that will bring an end to the Republican rule is at the end of this very prosperous decade, there will be a great economic crash, and the world, not just this country, but the world will enter into the greatest economic depression in history. It was absolutely horrible. It's not a little downturn. It's not a recession. It's not just inflation. It was that people, people in this country literally starved to death. We don't, when we talk to an American kid about people starving to death, they say, oh, it must be in Bangladesh or some other third world country. In this country, um, uh, people starve to death. For the first time in our history as a nation, more people left the United States than came to it during the Great Depression. It was absolutely horrible. And, uh, you know, but that will come at the end. That will come at the end of this decade. But for now, there were three Republicans in a row that dominated this decade. There are Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, the Republican ascendancy. Also, get this down. Did we talk about women voting yesterday? Okay, we we'll get we this debt. I'm sorry. We didn't get to convict. Oh, we didn't get to him? Well, uh, you, did, just, you just told us to write it. Did we talk about uh, Harding and his life, the mess? You know, yeah. first, yeah. some people say, the, and this is just what's up. There's no ev DNA, there's no what is called empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is evidence you can see, okay? Uh, but there, it was rumored that he might have had. African American ancestry, and so sometimes he's called the first black president. Uh, no big deal, but I just threw that in there. Well, anyway, uh, and of course we talked about they nominated Coolidge for vice president. Did we talk about it because he had stood up in the you know, okay against the guy? All right. So, and then there's this third candidate. You, you, do we write his name down? E. V. Debs. Yeah. Write him. Okay. Well, good. Eugene V. Debs. Uh, was the leading socialist in America. He, when we talked about Debs, when we talked about when we talked about the Pullman strike back, remember that uh, he had been a Democrat all of his life, and in the Pullman strike of 1894, remember when we talked about those strikes in the Gilded Age. Well, he became so disgusted because uh, Grover Cleveland, who was a Democrat, sent in troops to to break that strike. That he became a socialist. Okay. And remember this always. Anytime you see the name of Eugene V. Debs, E. V. Debs, your mind ought to automatically go to socialism. Uh, but by 1920, uh, you know, he's the head of the Socialist Party, but he's in prison. What do you reckon he was in prison for in 1920? What crime did he commit? Because you got to commit a pretty good, you know, you don't get sent to prison for jaywalking. You got to, you got to, you got to commit a pretty serious crime. Uh, to get sent to prison. Uh, what crime, what, what, what was he doing in prison in 1920? What was the biggest event that had just happened in America? And so what do you think, and what does that have to do with E.B. E. Debs, a socialist, being in prison in 1920? He criticized it. He criticized the war. Very good. Like who else? There's another socialist that went to prison. Shane. Very good. Very good. Well, you know, they're both socialists. And by the way, what law did both uh, Sh Charles Schenck and E.V. Debs, which law did they break? The Espionage Act. Excellent. The Espionage Act that had been passed in 1917. So he was in prison, but still, even in prison, the Socialist Party nominated him for president. And there's one of his campaign buttons. And he's convict. Did you get this down yesterday? Convict 9653. Did you write that? Yes. Okay. So that's what he ran as convict 9653. And guess what? He got a million votes. He got one. That's not bad. Campaigning from your prison cell. He got 1 million votes. Of course, he didn't have a chance of winning. And like I say, Hoover, excuse me, uh, Harding and uh, Harding and uh, uh, Coolidge won by a landslide. And also get this down. It's the first election presidential election in which women voted. 
Okay, so you know this country's two, and 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 by the way, in 2020, we commemorated the 100th anniversary of women being able to vote in America. Just think about that, this ladies and gentlemen. But just think about that. This country is 240 years old, and women have actually been able to participate fully for the last 100 years. That's a real shame. Okay, that's a real shame. Uh, this woman right here, and you don't have to write her down. I'm just going to illustrate my point. Uh, you know, I'm really big on voting. I think people ought to vote. Uh, I register people to vote. If you want to turn it, are any of you 18? You want to, when you turn 18, just come in here and in two minutes. One time I registered someone to vote uh, in front of the class, and I took my watch out and I timed it. Or I handed it to a student and I said, time us. And he looked at that and it took two minutes. Okay, I've had people, I've registered people to vote. And when they were done, I'd say, oh, wow, congratulations. Now you're a full-fledged citizen of the United States. And they would reach and pull their wallets out, thinking that it costs money to register to vote. It doesn't. And, and by the way, you, like everything else, you can do it online now. But I, I'm a I'm big proponent of voting. And I've had students ask me, or not students, well, students and colleagues say, well, since you're so, and I believe you ought to vote all the way from the school board to the White House. Every, never miss an election. Never, ever, ever. People, you know what, the number one, you, you, you understand that in the last election, 100 million Americans, think about it, 100 million Americans that could vote, didn't vote. You want to change America? Vote. You don't like something about it? Vote. But I, just think of all those 100 million people would have voted. What a difference it could have made in this country. But people ask me, since you're so big on voting, do you think we ought to have a law like Australia? You know, in Australia, on election day, if you don't vote, about three weeks later, you get a little card from the guy, you got to pay a fine. It's a pretty substantial fine. And people say to me, you think, absolutely not. As much as strong as I am for voting, you have the absolute right to never cast a ballot for the rest of your life if you don't want to vote. Uh, you know the number one reason that people say they don't vote. What is it? They don't have enough time. How long does it take to vote? Two minutes. How much? Two minutes. Five minutes. You know, you might have to stand in. I vote in a little country church, and usually there's 20. I go early because I'm on my way to school, so usually I'm the first or second person to vote. But there's usually, you know, you might have to wait. And if you live in a big city, people actually take off. Uh, some states have, you know, if you live in Dallas, Texas, there might be 400 people in line. So people take off. Say, like, gee, I wouldn't stand in a line of 400 people. Well, think about those guys that died for your right to vote. I've taken students over in Omaha Beach in Normandy, uh, where in about four hours, 2,000 young Americans that looked just like you died on June 6, 1944. Part of the reason they died, by the way, every race, creed, and color in this country out there on that beach, part of the reason those young people had their whole life ahead of them, just like you right now, the part of the reason they died was to secure your right to vote. I assure you, if Hitler and the Japanese would have won that war, uh, you would have never voted in your life. You would have been dictated to. And that's why they died. So, you know, they, so, you know when you compare their sacrifice to, well, gee, I might have to stand in line for 45 minutes, so I'm not going to vote. Uh, you're pretty pathetic, in my view. But I don't think you ought to be fine. You have the absolute right, if you never want to cast a ballot, to not cast one. Just go on and live your life free of charge and never participate. That's that's your right. And uh, I don't like it, but it's your right. I don't think you ought to be penalized in any way for that. However, all that said, I cannot understand, of all the people who don't vote, I cannot understand why women don't vote, why African Americans don't vote, why Native Americans don't vote, why, why Asian Americans don't vote. And Asian Americans, I can hardly put them in that category because they're strong when it comes to the vote. But I can't understand. When you look at what it costs, it costs something for all of us to be able to vote. But when you look at what it costs, those three particular groups, I just don't understand why they don't vote. And a perfect illustration, when I, and people died for the right of Native Americans to vote and African-Americans and women literally gave their lives. And a perfect point is this woman right here. She's not an American. She was a British suffragette. You can see that she, a suffragette, was someone who worked for the right to women to vote. She was a graduate of Oxford University. There she is in her academic robes. She got a master's degree. Not only the first woman to graduate from Oxford in England, uh, but, uh, you know, she got her master's degree there. Uh, and uh, she was a committed and dedicated a suffragette. Uh, and to call the attention of the world to the fact that British women could not vote, British women could not vote. You know, what's the most famous horse race in America? 
We have it every year. It's a big deal. It's the Kentucky Derby. You've heard of the Kentucky Derby? Watch it on the ESPN. It's next. It's coming right up. I think it's in May or June. Watch it on the ESPN. Oh, it's a big, big, big to do. Yeah, I'm going to go to it someday. Uh, the Kentucky Derby. Uh, well, in England, they have something like that. It's called the King's Derby. They pronounce Derby Derby, the King's Derby, or the Queen. The last 68 years, Elizabeth II, who's sitting on the throne now, is the longest reigned British monarch. She's been the Queen for 68 years, so it's been the Queen's <clears throat> Derby, but someday she'll be gone and her son will take over Charles or her grandson, William, <coughs> and it will become the King's Derby. But anyway, the reigning monarch, whoever it is, enters a horse in the race. And there was a king in England in 1914. He was the son of Queen Victoria that we talked about, King Edward VII. And uh, he had entered a horse. And so to call the attention of the world to the fact that women could were being denied the right to vote in England, Emily Wilding Davis purchased a ticket and went and stood right down here at the final curve of the race when the horses are coming around and they're heading for the finish line down here. And when the king's horse came by, which, by the way, the king's horse was in the lead of the race, she threw her body in front of the horse, and there she is trampled to death, and there's the king's horse. She literally committed ritual suicide to call. And, and of course, there are a lot of people, a lot of cynical sorts that say, well, how stupid, you know, give your life for something like that. I tend to believe what Martin Luther King said, who, by the way, gave his, Martin Luther King gave his life in an effort among other things, to get the vote for African-Americans. That's one example of many I could give you. But Martin Luther King said, if you haven't found something to give your, that you would give your life for, your life is worthless. That's what he said. And I used to ask, I used to do that quote and ask students, is there anything you would give your life for? And all they would say, oh, for mom and dad and my little brother and my little dog, Fifi, you know, and my boat, you know, I would get, no, he was talking about something outside your immediate concerns, a cause more than yourself that you would give your life for. Those guys that died on the beaches at D-Day, they gave their young lives for a cause much greater than themselves. Uh, and so did she, Emily Wilding Davis. That, you know, ladies, that sort of thing right there is what it took for you to get the right to vote. And again, if you don't want to vote, that's your business. That's your right. I don't understand it. And I never will. But that's what it costs for you to have the right to vote. And I hope you'll vote all the way from the, I hope you'll, it takes about two minutes to register and around here, the longest line you'll ever encounter, take you 10 minutes. You think that's too great a sacrifice every four years to give 10 minutes of your time? You think you're ever going to be so busy that you can't carve out 10 minutes on your social calendar to go down and vote every four years? You think you can squeeze, Mr. Mills, you think you can squeeze 10 minutes out every four years? Every six years? That's how we vote every four, every six years. I think you can, too. I'm so tired of seeing people come out of the voting booth. They come strutting out like, you know, I voted. I deserve the Medal of Honor. No, you don't. You exercise the privilege that we have that most people that live in this world never will have. So you don't deserve anything. You're doing your patriotic duty to this country when you vote. And by the way, you all have, you know, you can be one of these people that go live and say, well, I'm just going to, you know, live to myself. I'm just going to be concerned about myself and what I want and what I want to do. You can live like that, but that still doesn't negate the fact that you have a duty and you'll either answer the duty or you won't. And how you answer that duty in many ways, this great Republic depends on. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. I used to teach Western civilization. The Roman state lasted 1,200 years and it fell. And people would say, why did it fall? It fell because people lost interest in the government. They didn't support it. When you vote, you support your government. And when enough people stop, it goes away. <clears throat> Although there will always be idiots that say, well, so what if this government goes away? You know, they don't even know we have a country. They're so dense in their head. The biggest thought that ever crosses their mind is when is the next sale going to be at Walmart? Or what am I going to be able to put my little fingers around on Black Friday? That's what really counts in life. Idiots. Idiots. They don't know. Oh, anyway. But thankfully, there aren't many of them. Uh, I don't know. I think they ought to carve out part of West Texas 
and let them all live there. No, really, I do, because I don't like Texas, and I sure don't like West Texas. I've driven all over it. But just carve out, you know, Texas is big enough. It's 245,000 square miles. Just put them out there. Make a 51st state. Let them have a flag and governor. Call it Idiotsville. And they can just live out there, and the rest of us can go on and <clears throat> do what we're supposed to. By the way, there's her funeral, uh, you know, and it's guarded by four honor guards. Those were all suffragettes, and there goes her coffin through the streets of London, and tens of thousands of people uh, turned out for that. So uh, <clears throat> pretty important person. She gave her life for a cause um, higher than herself. So anyway, the election of 1920. Also got this down, the 20s is a great era of technological change. Of course, you've got the automobile. We're going to talk about that later. That's the biggest piece of technology. It may still be. But also the first radio broadcast in 1921. Got that down, 19, first time radio. Then in the 50s comes television. But in 1921, and I want to tell you what, the radio was the equivalent of the computer and the smartphone and the iPad combined. Until the 1920s, America was a pretty rural, isolated, small-town nation. If you lived in Eufaula, you never were quite sure of what was going on in Shakota and vice versa. We were pretty isolated. These little towns basically ran themselves. They had very little contact with the outside world. You know, after World War I started, it was weeks after World War I started until the news reached all of America, okay? Uh, but... Um, uh, the radio changed all that. Got this down. Now the American people could listen, all listen to the, and by the way, here's one of those, you know, when you walk in someone's living room in the twenties, they didn't have a screen up on the wall. They had this, this was an outwater kit. It was one of the most famous radios and it held a place of honor in the home. Uh, and, uh, you could listen, everybody could listen to the same music, the same news broadcast, the same sporting events. Get this down. It connected the nation. I mean, it really connected the nation. And it connected small-town America with the world. I, maybe it was our first global highway. Maybe it was our first global highway. And, and everything that you watch on television, you could listen to on the radio. They still have, somebody told me the other day in class, they still have soap operas, right? Can you name any soap operas? Days of our lives. You know why those things are called soap? You know what I'm talking about? They say reality TV has replaced those. Well, you know, they, they're sort of love stories in the middle of the afternoon. My mother's favorite was As the World Turns. You ever heard of that stuff? Anyway, my, well, my that's, stepmom watches. Huh? Office. My stepmom watches Mexican soap operas. Most of them are what? My stepmom watches Mexican soap operas. Mexican soap operas. Well, anyway, they're soap operas. You know why they're called soap operas? Because they started on the radio and soap companies, laundry detergent, Tide, they sponsored them on the radio, so they called them soap operas, okay? Uh, well, you could listen to that. You could listen to presidential speeches. You could listen to baseball games. Look, in 1910, if you'd have been down here at the feed store and you fall in 1910 and you'd said, you know, boys, someday <laughs> we're going to be able to sit right here in this feed store and you fall in Oklahoma. And listen <clears throat> to the New York Yankees play the St. Louis Cardinals in New York. They'd have packed you off to a rubber room. They would have said you're insane. But 11 years later, that's exactly what you could do. You could sit in Eufaula and listen to the New York Yankees play. The greatest team in baseball, the New York Yankees play uh, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, which the St. Louis Cardinals are, um, you know, I should say they're a pretty fair little team. But, of course, they're in the National League. And, of course, that damns them forever. But anyway – uh, you could listen to that on your, you could listen. To, are there any Cardinals fans here today? Any Cardinals fans? Well, if you are, don't raise your hand. It will lower your grade. But anyway, the, uh, you could listen to, you could listen to, uh, um, uh, the Yankees beat. Oh, well, any team they play, uh, on the radio right here in you fall. And that was, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. And by the way, the young people, Look at that. That's the first radio. And the you know, you saw see people wearing these headsets. They've never gone away. And people like me would walk by when I see you walking down the hall like this, heading for a doorway. I don't want you to do any brain damage. Or I go to an OU baseball game 
and there are kids that have paid to go to the baseball game, and the baseball game is going on, and they're sitting there reading their phone. I thought, why don't you save the money of the ticket, you know, and just sit at home and look at your phone, where they have things. I don't go to many movies, but the last time I went to one, oh, five or six years ago, they had a thing that came on that said, please silence your phones, you know. Uh, but anyway, we look at that and say, they're idiots. They're hooked to these phones. Oh my God. You know, they don't study, you know, they don't do anything. They're just walking around. There's zombies to their phones. Well, that's exactly what people said about the radio. And then by the way, uh, about the younger generation, when the television, my generation was the television generation. And our parents said the exact same thing that we say about you and your phones and your watches and iPads. And I don't know, I guess one day they're going to just insert a little chip in your ear, you know, and you can play with the buttons on your shirt and text people or something. But anyway, whatever's next. And don't worry, when you're my age, you just say, that old man up there, just grok, 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 grok. Yeah, when you're my you know, there's going to be something new that you can't even imagine now, and young people are going to have it, and you're going to be sitting there, and they're going to say, well, Grandpa, what are you shaking your head about? Well, bye, cracky, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, so it happens to every generation. Sorry. Happened to these poor guys. Somebody walked by that table and said, look at those stupid kids hooked to the radio, okay? Well, all right. They were hooked to the radio, too, and smoking. Get this down. In the 1920s, morals changed dramatically. Morals changed dramatically. It's one of the reasons it's called the Roaring Twenties. Morality, listen, morality is what any society decides is right and wrong. And by the way, morality changes all the time. And by the way, if you think that, you know, a lot of Americans who have never traveled, they think, well, you know, everybody all over the world pretty much believes in it. But no, just go travel and see the difference. Just land in France or land in Sweden or Norway or China or Bangladesh and see the different uh, morality that you will encounter there. Because every civil, and it's always been this, since the beginning of the human race. The human race always decides in the local area what is right and what is wrong. And it's constantly, constantly changing, okay? And in the 20s, one of the reasons the 1920s, get this down, one of the reasons the 1920s is called the Roaring Twenties, you've got a great economy, you've got the lost generation, but you've also got this change in morality, music change. All of a sudden, you've got jazz music. Do older people criticize you because of your music? They do. Do they? they? What is that? Country and Western? What? Well, that's good. Yeah, I'm an old person, and I listen to that, and I like that. Of course, here's the late, you know, I've kind of changed my musical taste, you know. I've been, uh, this morning, I was on the way to work, and uh, I was listening to uh, Lil Baby, okay? That's pretty good. I really like that, and no, I don't even know. I listened to him yesterday. This, did you all tell me about that? Is this the class that told me? Some class, I was talking about this, you know, and I said, I said, uh, Tiger. I listened to Tiger. That's from years ago. I was talking about this and I said, what kind of, and some guy said, uh, Tiger. And I, I didn't know what that was. You know, I said, if Tiger walked in here, whatever, who, I know there's a male, female, what is it? Uh, it's Tiger. So I wrote that down and just to show you how uh, up to date I am, I would say Tiger, but that's worn out. People said, boy, that's ancient history. You need to listen to, see, I wrote it down up there. Little baby, little, 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 is it, it's not little baby, it's little, little, like, yeah, little baby. Well, yesterday after school, you know, I was curious. I hope I never lose my curiosity, so I listened to a little bit of little baby. Listen to him, yeah. Worst thing I ever heard. <laughs> but I'm old. You know, you could listen to my music, except for our classicist over here. You could listen to my music and say, that's the worst thing we ever heard. The Beach Boys, what? And, but, of course, you know, all the great music, you know who the Beach Boys were? You ever listen to them? What do you think? Oh, really? Huh? Well, there's hope for America. And of course, you know the greatest musical group in history, Creedence Clearwater Revival, CCR. Yes, Bad Moon Rising. I, 19, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing the last time, I, the first time I heard Bad Moon Rising. You, have you heard of CCR? You heard of CCR? John Fogarty? Yeah. Yeah, you have Put your head down. You've learned enough. <laughs> All the Lil Baby fans in this class are going to fail. <laughs> CCR. <laughs> My dad, people said, you know, you think, you, you know, you think, 
my dad was part of the greatest generation. They saved the world. Now, what do you think they thought of us in the 60s? You think you got standards to look up to. My dad, I remember this just indelibly. It stamped in my mind. One time he and I were working on his car, and I don't know where was like, and we had these amazing technology, a little box about that big called a transistor radio, and you can get about three channels on it, stick it in your pocket, and hook a little thing. And it's kind of like those things you wear in your ear, but it had a cord. And my world history class was taught by a coach, and so it wasn't a class. We just went in there and talked and slept. And I sat back on this wall where Miss Kelly is, and he was over there, you know, working on the game plan for the Comanche game or something. So at World Series time, we would put that we'd fit right in your pocket and then in our ear. But, you know, you'd sit like this, so the blank side of your head was always facing him. And But somebody would hit a home run or drive, and somebody would go, yeah, like that. And he would look up and say, you're not listening to the baseball. Oh, no, 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 we're not listening to the baseball game. But, that, but anyway, one day I was lying out on the porch, and I had my old transistor radio going loud, and now, I mean, it was playing something there. And my dad walked by, and he started going to the house. I was going to drink water, and he just kind of turned. I was just laying over on that swing, and he just kind of turned and looked. And, get, and he got to the door, and he kind of leaned back and just looked at me like, oh, my God, you know, what about <laughs> inflicted on the world here with this idiot, you know? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I used to come in from mowing the yard, no riding lawnmower, and then we had a big yard, and he would say, and I'd, I'd slump down on the couch, and he'd be sitting there. He said, it's hot out there. I'd say, yeah, Dad, it's hot. He said, really? I said, yeah, it was really hot. He said, hmm. He said, Dad. While you were mowing out there, yes, sir. Were there any Japanese snipers shooting at you? You know how hot it was at Guadalcanal? So you couldn't complain around those guys. You know? See, I've been working so hard. My dad would say, you know what I worked for during the Depression? I pulled cotton for a nickel an hour, 10 hours a day, 50 cents. You that tired? No, Dad, I'm not that tired. Get away from me. I don't want to look at you anymore. You disgust me. Yeah. You, know, you think you've got hostile. You ought to have to live up to the high the standards of the greatest generation. Okay, yeah. A little little bit <laughs> different. Yeah. Any Japanese shooting at you? <laughs> Anyhow. Well, uh, uh, anyway. Uh well, so morals changed. Um, you know, get this down. There's jazz music, short skirts. Look at these women out of that. They, you know, they're showing their arms, their necks, their legs. Oh, my God, this is out at the beach. And they're smoking in public. Oh, my God. Oh, look at there. Those are modern women, okay, in the 1920s. Yes, look at that. Shocking. You know, we always knew women had legs because they moved around. We just couldn't see them until the 1920s. And then the skirts went above the knee. And they're so proud of their knees. They're sort of hiking their skirts up so everybody can see. Look at their hair. Up until this time. You know, you always do rebellious things to irritate the older generation. That's what your mission in life is. And let me just say about this generation, you're doing a hell of a good job at it. But anyway, they had, women always had this long, flowing hair. And their parents were just, oh, how big? Oh, we don't want to do anything our parents would like. So they cut it off short and they dyed it black and just shocked them. They couldn't believe, what is my daughter doing? She's gone wild. You know, and by the way, get this down. Women started migrating to the cities for the first time. The Industrial Revolution still going. Women are in the cities. They have their own apartment. They have their own church. For the first time, they're not under the supervision of their parents. Some of you are going to, you're all going to experience this, hopefully, unless you live at home till you're 47. But you're all, you're going to leave here in a few months. Not you people, well, I'll be a couple more. No, you've got a few months left, Dad. Then you're going to be out there in the big, white, bad world. And you're going to be making decisions on your own. And you're going to make some good ones. And you're going to make some bad ones, like everybody else in the human race. You're going to do some things you're proud of, and you're going to do some things you're ashamed of, like everybody else in the human race. Well, women had always been under the supervision of men. Until you married, you were almost your dad's property, and when you married, you were your husband's property. And if you never married, you were your dad. When he died, your brother took over. When he died, you might have an old uncle, but they controlled your finances and everything else. <coughs> but now in the 20s, get this down, women migrate to the cities to go to work. And they have their own salary. They have their own job. They have their own apartment. They're living independently. And if I get this down, America became an urban nation in 1921. We had been moving toward that since 1865 when the Industrial Revolution, we talked all about that kicked in, started drawing people. 
Up until 1921, we were a rural nation. Most people lived on farms. <clears throat> but in 1921, the majority of Americans were living in cities. And that, that trend has continued. How many Americans live in cities? To, how many Americans live on the farm today? In 1865, it was 60%. It was a clear majority. And they were farmers. I mean, they were real farmers. They weren't just people who got their pickup and went to the Sonic with a big hat on Saturday night with a can of skull and played that good old country and western music. Now, these men have you have a calf out there that you comb and curry and put a pink ribbon in for the fair. So I'm talking about real farmers. That's all they did. Uh, what percentage of Americans live in the city today? How much? In the city. In the city. How much? Well, you're pretty, well, that may be it. That may be it. I was going to say 90%, but 92%. There aren't very many people who live. And you think you live out in the sticks. Well, I'm just a little town hick from you falling. You know, that's what I know you're not, Jethro. Just calm down. Because just a rock's throw from this school is a highway, Highway 69. In two hours, you can be in Dallas, Texas, one of the major metropolitan areas in this country. And in a few hours more than that, you can be in St. Louis, and you can be in Chicago. As long as you live near one of those arteries, you know, I don't, major arteries, uh, transportation arteries, I don't care, you know, how you dress, how you talk, what you listen to, you're in an urban area. This is an urban nation. Starting in 1921, a majority became the urban, it became the urban nation. So women went to the city and they lived independently. The new woman, write that down. The new woman was created in the 20s. And they call these, look at this, I saved my money all my life to send my daughter to college. And what's she doing? She's over at a fraternity house at a party dancing this wild new dance called the Charleston. I'll show you some live couples doing the Charleston in the 1920s. I'll show you. She's gone absolutely wild. Look at her. She's crazy. That's what parents thought. That's what parents thought at home. These uh, new women, these modern women, got this down. They were called flappers. Flappers, okay? That's the code word of the 1920s. Flappers. By the way, women started doing things that only men had done up until that point. Uh, they drank. <coughs> they smoked in public. They drove automobiles. You understand that women have only been able to drive automobiles in Saudi Arabia for the last five years. It was against the law. Uh, and now women can drive in Saudi Arabia. But women started driving in this, and it was shocking. All this was shocking. Get this down as well. Drug use increased in America. All the drugs that we talk about today, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, abortion was on the rise. Church attendance dropped like a rock in the 20s. What's going to bring them back to the churches? When do they come back in record numbers? At the end of this decade, when what hits? Huh? No? The Depression. When they got hungry, they came back to church. So this is the lost generation. This is the hedonist. The purpose of life is pleasure. The purpose of life is pleasure. Well, of course, get this down. There was a reaction against all this. The older generation reacted against it. They said, we've got to get control of this lost generation or they will destroy America. And the, one of the main things they were concerned with was drug abuse. Drug abuse was through the roof. And of course, what was the most abused drug in America? Alcohol. Alcohol write that down. And so in 1918, 1918, <clears throat> excuse me, 1918, the 18th Amendment was passed. Oh, excuse me. Scratch that. A law called the Volstead Act was passed, okay? The Volstead Act. Prohibitionists, write that word down. Prohibitionists were people who wanted to stop alcohol. And they had long been looking for an opportunity to do that, to get laws passed that made alcohol illegal, Okay? And then came World War I. And you remember in World War I that we tried 
to conserve food. You remember that? Yes? What's alcohol made out of? Well, yeast is in it. But what's the main ingredient in beer and alcohol? Grain. Which grain in particular? Corn. Corn. Or corn whiskey? Well, good. Grain. Beer is made out of, they add hops to it, and yeast, hops, hops, and grain. In other words, food. And they said, you know what? The prohibitionists got this down. They convinced the government in 1918, here we are at war, and we're trying to save food. They said, well, why waste this food on alcohol? Let's just, as long as the war is going on, let's just make booze illegal. And so the government went along with that to save food. And most Americans went along with it because they said, you know, this is our patriotic duty. So the Ballstead Act was a temporary measure to stop the production of alcohol in order to save food during World War I. But when the war was over, get this down, when the war was over, the Ballstead Act, the prohibitionists are going to morph the Ballstead Act into the 18th Amendment. In other words, during the war, the prohibitionists sort of gathered up a head of steam, and they uh, they uh, get the 18th Amendment passed. And get this down: the 18th Amendment. You with me? Yes. You still with me? The 18th Amendment outlawed liquor in America, which means this: if you have a six in in, in, night, in, in, in that's in 1920. That means in 1920, if you had a six-pack of beer in your refrigerator, that would be as illegal as if you had several cartons of heroin in your refrigerator right now. It became illegal. By the way, speaking of heroin, heroin was perfectly legal at the time. Perfectly legal. Heroin. Heroin is was legal until 1984. It was legal. If a baby had colic, that's when a baby throws up. And every time you went to birth, you just puked down the whole thing, you know, just kept on it. You'd take him to the doctor, the doctor would give him heroin, prescribe it for babies. Cocaine uh, was legal uh, until the 1950s, maybe 60s. Excuse me, teachers, but I need Christopher Warrior, Alyssa Wise, and Bridget Earnhardt to come to the office. All doctors carried cocaine in their medical bags. I have an aversion to needles. If I have to give a blood sample, I mean, don't ever go to a clinic around here where I've been and mention my name because they'll throw you out and, and lock the door because when they start coming at me with a needle to do a blood, I just, you know, I, I just I hate needles. I just say, get away from me. They all hate me. So don't mention my name. They'll double your bill or something. And I hate to get, I don't have much, my teeth are pretty good, but when I have that, they, I hate to get a shot in the gums. They didn't used to do that. They would just, Swab there, just the dentist would just pull his cocaine out and just swab your gum, and the whole side of your head would go numb and it'd pull your I would, I've never used cocaine, never would voluntarily use it. But if they wanted to put a little, I'm telling you, on my job, pull a tooth, I would be all for that and just let the whole side of my head go numb. I think they would need a detox room, just let me go lay down a couple of hours, don't let me drive. You know, I might get that cocaine and start thinking, I don't know, I'm the king of Bulgaria or. <laughs> Napoleon, you know, and they could just come in and ask me, you know, do you still think you have every 30 minutes or so, do you still think you're Napoleon? And I would say, well, get away from me. I'm right in the middle of the Battle of Waterloo. No, you know, but when, when I finally said, no, I'm not Napoleon, what's wrong? And they said, well, you get your car and go home. But I would much rather have that than somebody stick a needle in me. I hate needles, okay? <laughs> if you're ever in charge of a terrorist group and you kidnap me and say, how can we get information out of him? Just say, just get a little needle, and he'll just sing like a bird. I will. I'll tell you everything I know twice. Anyway, just don't stick me with that needle. Anyway, shouldn't have said that. You'll all bring needles tomorrow. But anyway, <laughs> you want to take the essay test? Uh huh. We got needles. Anyway, um, well, uh, you know, there's. A, I'm out of time, so I'll just kill the last sixty seconds with this. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, was the first real radio president, and he had a magnificent speaking voice. He's our first media president, and but he had a severe sinus condition, and when his sinuses were blocked, you're probably too young. You remember Daffy Duck? 
Well, when he started to speak on the radio, he said it's like Daffy Duck. So his doctor, if he had that condition, would just stick a Q-tip in his cocaine and just rub his nose, kind of like taking a COVID test, and then just open right up, and you'd think it was Roosevelt. Well, you know, I was driving to school one morning, they had one of these silly radio, and they said, which American president used cocaine? And they were calling it with all sorts of names. Abraham Lincoln. And finally they said, no, it was Franklin Roosevelt. You know, they told that story. And it's true. I knew that, but they did. Uh, but it's, you know, and, and I'm sure people in the audience said, well, my God, I didn't mean, you know, I mean, there's Roosevelt in the cabin room snorting a line of cocaine. No, that wasn't, you know, I mean, it wasn't, you know, he was on cocaine and he woke up and said, we bombed who? Uh, you know, no, it was, it was just a medical procedure and that was commonly done. Okay. By the way, marijuana was legal for 20,000 years. Uh, it was legal until 1937. It was not, you know, I mean, uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be legal again, okay? It's going to be legal again. Well, anyway, study, be prepared for this essay coming here tomorrow night. Like this.